and I'm Ron Hawkins, uh, Director of Industry Relations at SDSC. Today we have uh, we have an encore performance from uh, Giga IO. I think they joined us uh, a couple of years ago, and you know this is this is a company that's really been in it for the long game, in the fullness of time as as we've seen the emergence of uh, greater reliance on heterogeneous computing. This need for uh, disaggregation and, and composability um, in large-scale computing environments has uh, has has really become uh, evident. So, uh, without further ado, I will hand it off to Alan. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Ron, and and uh, you know, obviously, all the work that we've done with San Diego Super Computing over the years has uh, been invaluable to to us. The obviousness of needing a fabric-based computing is becoming quite evident. These slides are from NVIDIA, and now obviously they have a lot of interest in showing that Moore's Law has actually run its course. CPUs in and of themselves alone do not drive performance any longer. Heterogeneous compute uh, really does help uh, uh, tremendously in terms of performance. And... Uh, you know, with NVIDIA's help and AMD's help, and now Intel is really into this, the number of applications now that can take advantage of GPUs and other kinds of accelerators has really exploded. And so, you know, it, it was interesting. I, I looked at this data five years ago, this number was less than 300. And, you know, it's, uh, this, is, this is a couple of months old data now at 1800, and we're probably up to 2000. I mean, the pace at which applications are being modified to take advantage of GPUs is really accelerated. And by the way, that's one of the issues. So I wanna be able to use all my existing infrastructure, but I also have to be able to easily accommodate new things. And at the end of the day, uh, God, we've heard this a thousand times, please. This has to be easy to deploy. It, I, it, it can't become more hassle. Uh, my IT staff has to be very capable of doing this. And ideally I use my existing tools. And so we'll, what we have created is uh, what we call fabrics. It's a universal dynamic fabric, and it is the only routable PCI and in the future CXL right throughout the rack. And it does what, what we've talked about. It'll work with any workload, any component. It's based upon open standards. If they conform to the PCI spec, it just works, right? If you try to, if you got to run a job here on eight GPUs, there's quite a bit of performance that is lost when you communicate between these two. Now in the future, we think it goes this way, right? So the fabric system becomes the new top of rack switch. And we have resource boxes here where we will pull the GPUs out of the servers and they now become part of a resource box. There's no servers in these boxes, right? I mean, they are simply a set of resources that are now available to anything in the network. And the servers consequently become much simpler. So all of the heating and cooling and all those sorts of requirements come out of the servers. They become much simpler again. They go back to being, you know, in most cases, 1U units. And oh, by the way, because we route PCI, we still do all the connections between the servers. So if you're running MPI jobs, for example, or anything that requires TCP IP or NVMe over fabrics or whatever, it runs natively on fabrics. So the servers now can access any of the GPUs and anything that's in the system. So real simply, you know, this is the simple composition and resource sharing. You know, you've got a job, you've got a handful of servers, one server grabs eight GPUs, the next server needs to have four. You're setting this up through you know, the software that you're used to. So if you're running Slurm, you submit your Slurm job exactly the way you've always submitted your Slurm job. And we have worked with outside vendors now that have the Slurm plugin that will recognize the resources being requested and will compose this on the fly. Or if you're using OpenStack or Kubernetes or uh, you know, singularity containers and control IQ software or bright computing or whatever software that you want to run, we can run with. You know, one of the other benefits here is it gives you a lot of different flexibility. So we've shown that, you know, we were using one, one kind of accelerator. Well, you know, there's nothing to say that 
in these resource boxes, you can't have, you know, some GPUs that are really quite good at, you know, let's say high precision floating point. And maybe you then want to run some different types of accelerators for inferencing. You're not tied to a particular kind of accelerator in these boxes. And it's very easy to add resources as you grow. And so, you know, you don't have to add large slugs of racks of racks of equipment or uh, whatnot. You know, you need to add a handful of, of GPUs into your system to improve performance. You add a couple of GPUs. It's very easy to add and upgrade and change as as you go. And and because these th these boxes from us are actually uh, 10 slot devices, you can also add, for example, Intel Optane drives directly into the box and have really fast access to, to you know, scratch memory, for example. And, and at the end of the day, you know, increasingly people want to let the workflow drive the composition of a, a, of a particular server or of a cluster. And this is often quite difficult to do. So in this particular case, there's 16 GPUs. There's very few servers on the market that can actually handle 16 GPUs. And it's going to be a relatively newer server that can even handle eight. And so in this case, you know, we're running an NVIDIA nickel ring across all 16 GPUs. And oh, by the way, we've, we've extended, we've extended the nickel ring now out to 32 GPUs which is uh, uh, really kind of interesting because very few people can do it, we've been told. And so whether or not you're running this on, you know, if you've got two servers that can handle eight GPUs each, or maybe you've got some older servers that you would really like to continue to get more benefit from, uh, and they can only handle two or four GPUs, guess what? You can still pool these together because across fabrics, we can run that GPU direct RDMA across the various servers and still give you a large pool, even if the servers themselves can't handle it. So now let's talk about some of the performance tests. So you might say, you know, geez, this is really great. I can, I can, I can disaggregate, I can re-aggregate, but what happens on the performance side? Test number one and, and data is converged versus composed. Uh, converged, in this case, we took eight GPUs and stuck them inside of a server. And so, you know, it was one of the one of the big servers. In this case, the Supermicro uh, Big Twin. Uh, we added eight GPUs. This particular server, four GPUs are attached to a particular processor, four to the other processor. And so, communication, if you're going from one side to the other, goes through the UPI bridge. Everything else can communicate uh, GPU to GPU. One benefit of being able to compose. GPU. So we took all eight GPUs and stuck them inside our resource appliance. The all, you know, they will all talk to each other directly uh, across our across our network. If you and I'll show you if you have multiple boxes, right, it never has to come back to the compute node. And that has a large impact on performance. So here's composed versus converged. And you can see the results are are the same. So in the in, in, so this is one GPU, whether you put it inside the server or whether you compose it to the server has no impact on performance. And in fact, when you got to the eight, the composed, right, being in that resource box actually runs significantly faster than having them inside the server. So architecturally, whether you put them in the server or whether you compose them will have little impact. Um, and in fact, it may, it may be beneficial depending upon the server itself. So now let's look at what happens if you run a job where you have the GPUs effectively inside a server. In this case, we composed, we took all eight, we composed them to a server right, ran what NVIDIA calls GPU direct, the ability for GPUs to talk to themselves within the box. And we compared it to running uh, RDMA, right? So this is, we have two compute nodes where we've composed GPUs. So effectively we have the same eight GPUs and you can think of it as 
four GPUs in this server, four GPUs in this server, and we're going to run the job across uh, the entire construct. And in this case, instead of running a GPU direct over InfiniBand or over Ethernet, we're running it over Fabrics. And this one probably will surprise you, right? Because the results would show, and let me, let me explain this real quick. We have two tests here. We have ResNet 50 and we have Inception testing. The blue bars in each case are the number of GPUs that are in one server. So this is eight GPUs sitting inside of one server. The yellow bars are the same number of GPUs just split up between two different servers. And in our case, running this across fabrics, it simply doesn't matter. So whether you have two GPUs composed to a server, which was the same as two GPUs sitting inside the server, or you put one in each, you're going to get the same numbers. So if you're trying to revitalize older servers, this is a great construct now. So you can, you can easily add GPUs to older servers. And when you need to do larger jobs, you can still run that job across multiple servers. You know, in this case, we're actually running faster when we've split the jobs up. And then in terms of scaling, we took a, we, for fun, we took a case where we took, uh, we took 32 GPUs and we put them into the resource boxes, attached it to a compute node, and we're successful in getting this construct to run well. And as you can see, it scales really well. Whether we were doing this, in this case, this was one, one compute node with 32 GPUs, or from the last chart, you could see if we split this up and put eight and four different servers, you're gonna get pretty much the same results here. So your ability to scale out when you need larger numbers of GPUs is gonna work really well. So now let's talk about the San Diego use cases. We've done really nice work. Uh, this one was done about 18 months ago now, and it's, it's really germane to the topic. So one of the applications that they run there is a uh, seismic uh, simulation package called AWP. And Ron initially uh, gave us the mandate. He said, the existing setup runs pretty well. Uh, is there a way to match that performance, and, but for less money? Right. We kept getting, you know, and at the end of the day, we delivered 25 percent higher performance for about a third of the cost. So we'll come back to this one. Let me let me show you this, the, the test setup. The existing system was very similar to what we talked earlier. They have an InfiniBand switch. They had uh, four servers that they were using with four GPUs each. And initially, our system looked very similar to this setup. And as the researcher in this case, is a gentleman by the name of Dawei Mu was working on the system. He started to realize that he didn't necessarily have to mirror the same setup. And at the end of the day, he, he, this was the final configuration. It was actually, he went from four servers to one server where we started with four. And he was actually attaching all the GPUs to a single server and he added storage directly into the network. So now to come back, you know, we, we ended up with 25% higher performance. Um, what, you know, so the, their existing system is, you know, the Comet system there is, uh, uh, you can tell this is a couple of years old now. They were running P100s at the time, uh, which, which then were $6,500 a piece. Uh, we were running 1080 TIs. We were a brand new startup company. We couldn't afford the P100s. Um, you know, the 1080 TIs, obviously they're not there any longer. And they were at the time about a thousand dollars a piece. So on the uh, performance scale, what is it that the P100s got you? Well, lower is better on this chart. And so if you were running this on one GPU, you can see the P100 is about 50% faster, right? As an individual GPU. So that's what your $5,500 bought you for GPU cost uh, differential. However, once you got to four GPUs, we had actually caught up in performance. <clears throat> and remember now, this is $4,000 worth of GPUs that are now running at the same performance as $26,000 worth of GPUs. 
And when you got out to eight GPUs, we're actually running faster, considerably faster. And remember, this is $8,000 of GPUs against over $50,000 worth of GPUs in Comet. You can see the utilization of the GPUs drops dramatically. Meantime, in Fabrics, it's still run, chugging along well into the mid 90s. And so even though they're a less powerful GPU, the fact that they're fully utilized, fully stocked with memory, uh, keeps them keeps them moving right along. Now that study then got Dawei thinking, and he actually proposed this process. And this is back to letting the workflow decide the configuration. And so it turns out in in the work that they do, they actually have a two step process. So they're getting the data in from the field. Step number one is to do the computation on all the field measures. So they can actually do the computation on the seismic waves themselves. And step number two then is to take the, the, the output of the computation and run a visualization so they can watch this seismic wave roll down the hillside. So Dawe realized he had complete control over how the GPUs and how the CPUs interacted with each other. And so what he did was he took a handful of the GPUs. In this case, we still kept the same model. He took the data, he moved it to step number one to do the compute. And instead of moving it back and running it separately, the output of the compute was fed directly into the visualization GPUs. And you know the results were really dramatic because it cut the time for him to do the entire workflow, which is really what mattered, he cut it in half. And a side benefit that he has noted is that most other applications that were running actually improved in performance because he reduced the network traffic because he stopped moving the, the data back and forth so many times. And so instead of worrying about data offloads and so on, just don't move the data as often. So in summary, you know, IT is being asked to, to do a lot more work than they've ever, than they've ever uh, had to do. They're supporting really uh, dramatically expanding workloads, a diversifying uh, architecture in terms of acceleration and storage. And oh, by the way, they're being asked to do it on the same budget. And as we've seen, each of the workloads, they're lumpy, they're lumpy in their own ways. And so it's not just a matter of putting together an infrastructure with a bunch of different resource, right? You need to be able to optimize these architectures and ideally let the workflow determine the infrastructure as opposed to forcing the workflow to deal with the architecture that you've got. And so we really do believe then that Fabrics it, as a universal dynamic fabric really lets I, I, IT do this. So it enables you to improve the system performance by adding in all of these new accelerator technologies. You can very easily revitalize existing infrastructure. You do not have to go out and do forklift upgrades on everything that's there. And therefore it makes it much easier to meet budget requirements and because you're getting better utilization out of the resources, you get better sustainability and better uh, power usage. So with that, I am done and we will open it up to questions that may have uh, come in. And thank you, Alan, for you and your team for uh, the update today. and. Uh... Like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's been a marathon, not a sprint for you guys. So con, con, congratulations on all the, the projects and, and, and uh, our progress and, and where you've been able to get to with the, uh, with the technology. And we look forward to hearing from you guys again and, and doing more with you.